As stated, my name is Eber Brown III. I'm thankful to be here as well. Uh, as I understand it, the mayor wasn't able to make it tonight. <laughs> so as one born and raised in this beautiful city, allow me to say welcome to Baltimore. I'm really excited that you're here, and I am appreciative of the opportunity to share brief remarks. In the summer of 2010, I traveled to Palestine, Israel with an organization called Interfaith Peace Builders. I decided to join this delegation because of a nagging and growing suspicion related to what was being presented as news about the so-called Middle East by corporate media here in the States. The simplistic and grossly one-sided narrative around the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis just did not seem believable to me. To this day, I still have these images in my head provided by the news of Palestinian boys throwing rocks at armored tanks and the tanks shooting back. Why in the world, I asked myself, would boys put themselves in such a dangerous predicament? I mean, I participated in my own share of risky play as a boy, but this seemed wholly irrational and without much context provided to go along with the images, this was exactly the conclusion that the news wanted me to have. My ignorance and confusion propelled me to find out for myself what was going on. Not only did the media serve as a catalyst for my journey five years ago, but I was also moved after sensing something faulty in the theological discourse around Israel in the Christian circles that I grew up in as well. Well, the Bible is one of the biggest problems related to Palestinian freedom, said Reverend Naeem Atik in a Seville workshop I attended in 2009. This ironic statement also propelled me to take my own journey, given that historically, the Bible has not just been problematic to Palestinian freedom, but the Bible has been problematic historically and even in contemporary times to the freedom of black people in these so-called United States of America. To see for myself what was really going on. It didn't take me long to learn that something was terribly wrong in the place that has been called the only democracy in the Middle East. <laughs> Minutes after getting off the plane at Madurian Airport, I and my delegation began making our way to baggage claim. I was the only black man in this group, and the soldiers at the airport watched my entire delegation walk by and said not a word. However, as I tried walking past them at the back of the group, they stopped me and began to interrogate me with their high-powered rifles at the ready. Who are you? Where are you going? Who are you here to visit? What did you plan to see? How long are you staying? I answered their questions one by one. However, they were not satisfied. Our group leader eventually turned and noticed that I had been cornered and was being interrogated. Only after she came and confronted the soldiers did they allow me to pass. If I had any doubts about my being interrogated strictly because of the color of my skin, those doubts were laid to rest. And I was singled out by soldiers time and time and time again during my brief stay in Palestine, Israel. My experience at that airport was not dissimilar to the experience of Michael Twitty, an African-American culinary historian who underwent an orthodox conversion to Judaism, but was still interrogated. Or that of Sherelle Brown, an organizer who traveled to the occupied West Bank, Jerusalem, and Israel with members of Black Lives Matter, Black Youth Project 100, and Green Defenders during the year. Reflecting on his experience, Twitty said he was keenly aware of the double standard based on color and appearance. Surely, however, I did not come in tonight to talk about the bad experiences that three people had at one airport. More so, it is what that experience represents. In a 2007 lawsuit, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel challenged the pattern of separate and unequal treatment of Jews versus non-Jews, and while they focus on the airport, this pattern exists throughout Palestine and Israel. Palestinians, Arabs, African-descended people, and others are pre-classified as dangerous and a threat and are treated as such. This pattern and the system which supports it has been the topic of intense debate and widespread demonstrations in this country as well. There is a historic pattern which pre-classifies black people as persistently
incredibly dangerous, and that classification provides justification for the way we are and have been perceived, presented, and engaged in this so-called democracy. This were but symbolically connected events reignited the flame of black freedom, justice, and self-determination. The murder of Michael Brown, August 9, 2014, in Ferguson, which occurred two and a half years after the murder of Trayvon Martin, February 6, 2012, which occurred five months after the state execution of Troy Davis, September 21, 2011, reignited the spirit of radical activism in many parts of the black community, and we must not forget that black women have been brutalized and victimized by the same pattern of system And the way to get 
give credence to the oppression of other people. We don't have to do that. That our struggles should stand on their own. They are valuable by themselves. And I close on this. We're going to hear a whole lot of Dr. King this week in our nation. <laughs> I'll share this with this book, Why We Can't Wait. 1964, human beings with all their thoughts and strengths constitute the mechanism of a social movement. They must make mistakes and learn from them. Make more mistakes and learn anew. They must taste defeat as well as success and discover how to live with each. Time and action are the teachers. I pray we take the time that we need this weekend so we might deliver on the action that's needed in all our communities across this country. God bless you.